3D games are pretty insane. Every year the graphics keep getting better and GPUs just keep getting more powerful. But back in the 70s when the first 3D games came out, GPUs didn't even exist. Instead, engineers had to rely on clever tricks and extreme efficiency to make these games possible. It was kind of a beautiful era of engineering, before computers got faster and took the fun out of it. But one of the reasons I like Redstone so much is because it's permanently in that era. If you want to make a fast Redstone game, you have to use clever engineering. So this got me thinking, what if I could use some of those tricks from the 70s and engineer a fast 3D redstone game? As it turns out, I'm not the first person to think of this idea. In December of 2022, Oscar91 made a redstone computer that could run a 3D maze program. And although it was slow, because all redstone computers are slow, there was actually no 3D math going on. Instead, it used a special display consisting of two separate screens. On the right screen, there's a top-down view of the maze that the player is in. So for example, if it looks like this and the player is here, that's the equivalent of being in this maze. And then on the left screen, there's a 3D first-person perspective. This is where the magic happens. It might look like it's a complicated 3D render, but it's actually just a segment display. The way it works is there are five overlapping regions. Each region directly corresponds to one of these five blocks around the player. If there's a solid block directly in front of the player, this region turns on, showing the front face. If there's a solid block here, then this region turns on, showing the side face and the front face. And if there's a solid block here, this region turns on, showing just the side face. Then it's the same thing on the other half because it's symmetrical. This technique was genius. It allowed Oscar to show many different situations within the world. And because it's just a segment display, it's clearly a great way to achieve both speed and 3D graphics. So when I saw this, I thought, this is it. I'm gonna make an even better 3D maze explorer of my own using the same technique. Step one was to generalize Oscar's pattern for a bigger display. I wanted to not just see five blocks, but rather an entire hallway of blocks. That way I could see way further into the maze as I explored. Notice that the two side faces, here and here, are both the same shape. The closer one is just a scaled up version of the further one. So continuing this pattern, you can actually show the side face of any block in this column with just smaller and smaller trapezoids. Similarly, if you make the screen a little bigger, you can see that the next closest front face is just a scaled up version of the further one. So you can also continue this pattern to show any front face with smaller and smaller rectangles. Then if you assign a region to each matching pair of side face and front face, you can show any block in this column. And of course, you can do the same thing on the other side. The only problem with this is if there's a too wide gap in the wall. In that case, it looks like it's missing parts of the blocks. However, since this is being used for a maze explorer, I can actually guarantee that that will never happen. More on that later. And then for the middle column, you can just make regions of smaller and smaller squares as the block gets further away. And with that, the pattern is generalized to any 3xx hallway of blocks. Here are some different situations and what they look like. In Minecraft, building this display was extremely straightforward. The hardest part, honestly, was just deciding how long I wanted the view distance to be. I ended up making it 6 long, which felt like plenty. To be clear, that means the display will be able to show a 3x6 area around the player. Then once I knew the distance, I just marked out all the segments I needed with colored wool, and I made a redstone wire to activate each one on the screen. So for example, this wire here activates this segment. From there, it was just a matter of connecting segments together to form the correct regions. And after about six hours of easy, but definitely very tedious wiring, I had a nice three x six array of signals behind the screen. Putting in these blocks makes the screen show this, or putting in these blocks makes the screen show this. Also, it's worth mentioning that even though the player is standing on this bottom block, you can still activate it. According to the pattern, it'll just fill up the entire screen, which I guess makes sense because what else would you see if you're inside the block? And yeah, there's not much else to talk about here, it really is just a segment display. As always, it was fun to make because Minecraft is just a great platform to do this in. But if you want another great platform to do nerdy things, then you should definitely check out today's sponsor, Boot.dev. Boot.dev is the best way to learn backend development. They use tactics from game design to help you reach your goals without ever getting bored. I tried out the Python course myself, and it immediately felt different than any other learning site. I was earning XP, levels, completing quests, and I could even see my spot on the global leaderboard. I also noticed that there's an AI wizard specifically trained for each lesson. The wizard uses the Socratic method to ask you questions until you've basically solved the problem yourself. And if that's not working for you, Boot.dev has a Discord server with tons of real people always willing to help you out. Now learning backend development is kind of a big investment and it might not be for everyone. That's why Boot.dev offers a 30 day no questions asked refund policy and a free demo of the interactive experience on every course. So go on over to Boot.dev and try them out. Then use my code MattBatWings at checkout to get 25% off your entire first year if you choose the annual plan. 
Now that I had a working display, it was time to figure out how to actually explore a maze. If you've seen my video on mazes, you might remember that you can represent any maze with a graph, or a set of vertices and edges, where every edge corresponds to a pathway in the maze. For example, if you're given this graph, then the maze it's representing looks like this. The graph and the walls are just two equivalent ways to represent a maze. So for my project specifically, I decided to use a 4x4 graph for the maze. This seemed like the smallest possible size that still had a lot of complexity. To represent this in Minecraft, I made a set of inputs for the edges of the graph. For example, if I input these edges, then I'm referring to this graph, and therefore this maze. Then I made a small circuit to convert those edges to the actual world of tiles that the player will explore. The way it works is it starts with a 9x9 map of all solid tiles. And wherever there's an edge, it removes up to three of them. If it's a horizontal edge, it removes them like this, or if it's a vertical edge, it removes them like this. What you're left with is a 9x9 map that looks exactly like the original maze. And by the way, remember when I said that a two wide gap would never happen on a side column? Well now I can explain why. It's because even if you input every single edge, there's nowhere the player can be that creates a gap of more than one on a side column. The worst you can do is make it alternate, on, off, on, off, which the display can show perfectly. Now I just needed a circuit to help me explore this tile map. My first thought for this was to use a shift register to physically move the player. For example, let's say the player is right here, and they can either move forward, turn left, or turn right. If you made a shift register, it would just listen to those three inputs and move the player accordingly. Not a terribly difficult circuit so far. But then, you'd need to make the screen always receive the correct 3x6 area as the player moves around and turns. Suddenly, that's a way more difficult circuit. So then I came up with a better way to do this. Instead of shifting the player, shift the entire maze. Motion is relative, so you can still explore the maze in the same way. And now, the redstone only has four possible 3x6 areas to worry about, one for each direction the player can face, instead of the hundreds it had to worry about before. Putting this all into Minecraft, I started by making a giant shift register for the maze. This let me move the entire thing in any direction, up, left, down, or right. The player is always right here in the middle, and the whole point is that they never physically move. After that, I wired out the four different 3x6 areas around the player, and I made the current direction control which one is allowed through. And then over here, I made the buttons to move forward, turn left, and turn right. I honestly could have added more options, like move backwards or turn around, but I don't know, I just really like the minimalistic approach with only three buttons. Alright, let's explore a maze! Obviously the screen looks really good, especially for no 3D math, but something was still bothering me. The original goal of this project was to make it fast, yet it was still pretty laggy, mainly because there was a ton of redstone dust updating whenever the screen changed. So I decided to make a new, lag-friendly screen that just shows the outlines of regions instead. This involves some new priority circuits to make sure that only the closest blocks show up on the screen, otherwise you'll just see all of them at once, which is a complete mess. But once that was all finished and hooked up, the build was way faster. I couldn't believe how much snappier it was to use. And in my opinion, it looked a lot better too. The outlines made it easier to tell the blocks apart from each other and to gauge distances. Now at this point, I was planning on ending the video here, but then I had a great idea for one more really cool feature. You see, since my maze video, there's been a bit of an explosion of redstone mazes on YouTube, and the community has made some really insane maze generators, like this one by Captain Luma. You might see where I'm going with this. These generators typically output the edges of the maze graph, which is exactly what my explorer takes in. So why not invite Captain Luma to this project and see if he wants to make a random maze generator in the back? Hello everyone, this is Captain Luma. I was very excited when Matt reached out to me to help with his project. He needed a system to generate a random 4x4 maze that would be used as the map for the explorer. This on its own sounded pretty easy, but he had one extra restriction that complicated things. The screen can only display up to six tiles ahead. This means that if there's a three node long hallway, the display is at max length. But if there's a four node long hallway, then the display won't be able to render it. The screen will look like this, where the hallway just cuts off at the end. So I had to find some way of generating a maze without any of these long hallways. I tried a bunch of existing algorithms and I tried reworking them to remove the long hallways, but no matter what I tried, I just couldn't figure out how to do it. Eventually, I determined that it was impossible to accomplish this with a maze generating algorithm. I needed another way. Then I thought, 
Instead of using an algorithm, I could store every single 4x4 maze that doesn't contain long hallways and just pick a random one. So over the weekend, I created a program to generate every possible 4x4 maze, which gave me about 100,000 results. Then, I filtered out all the mazes that contained long hallways, which left me with just over 2,600 mazes. This is substantially less than what we started with, but it's still way too much data to store in Minecraft. So how can we lower the result further? Well, it turns out that most of these mazes are just rotated and mirrored copies of each other. So, I filtered out all the rotated and mirrored copies, as well as any combinations of the two, which resulted in just 335 mazes. Much better. Now I needed a way of storing all this data in Minecraft. To do this, I created this read-only memory. Each maze is stored as a column of barrels with items in each. Each barrel gives off a signal strength value representing a single hexadecimal digit. So in essence, each maze is stored as a six-digit hexadecimal value. This value can be decoded into a 24-bit binary number, where each bit represents a connection in the maze. If the bit is zero, then there isn't a connection. However, if the bit is one, then there is a connection. For example, this hex value decodes to this binary number, which represents this maze. Next, I added this circuit, which converts the signal strength value to binary. And then I wired each output to a segment of the maze. Now, when we read from a location on the ROM, we get a maze. Here are some of my favorites. This one kind of looks like a villager. And this one is just a single path. This system already meets all the requirements, but there was one more thing I wanted to add. Remember how in an earlier step I filtered out all the rotated and mirrored copies? Well, now we can get them back by performing a random transformation to this maze using redstone. This will bring our number of possible mazes back up to 2600. To do this, I added these three circuits which I call bitmappers. Each circuit takes some binary data as the input, then it rearranges the bits in whatever way we like. And each layer will rearrange the bits in a different way. For this contraption, each layer will perform a different transformation. So we can give it the maze data as an input, pick which transformation we want, and we'll output the transformed maze data. To demonstrate, I have this maze. Right now, we're on layer 1, which means no transformation is applied. But if I switch to the second layer, the maze will rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise. Next, I created a randomizer circuit to randomly select a maze from the ROM, and another circuit to choose a random transformation to apply. With that, we have a maze generator capable of generating any 4x4 maze that doesn't contain long hallways. All that was left was to plug my machine into Matt's display, and the final build was complete. Thank you so much, Matt, for having me on this project. If you like this video, you'll definitely like my 3D wireframe video, so go check that out next. I hope you learned something, I hope you enjoyed. Peace out guys.